Okay, thank you all for uh, coming to our uh, second designer panel. Um, this one is going to be more, uh, our first one for those of you that were here was talking, well, I don't need to tell you, for those of you who are not here, talked about co-designing. Um, so that one will be available later online if you would like to see that if you missed it. Um, and this one we're, we're going to talk more generally about sort of the state of the industry and more general design topics of what it's like to be a game designer, publisher, and developer uh, here in the year 2019. Um, so first, uh, to introduce our panel, um, so starting on the end here, we have uh, Richard Borg. Um, Richard is the designer of the um, Commands and Colors series, which included, uh, I think Battlecry was the first one, and had Memoir 44 and Battle Lore, various other games. I also believe he's the only person up here who's won the Spiel de Jar, but I could be wrong on that. Is that correct? <laughs> I won. No, I've never won. <laughs> okay. Uh, for, um, for Liar's Dice? Yes, back in, back in the 90s. Um, so next to him we have uh, Mr. Eric Lang. So Eric is uh, uh, the game director at Come On, which I learned today is how it's actually pronounced, so I was excited about that. If I learn something in a day, that's good. Um, and he has uh, uh, done a wide variety of games, um, including... Um, Rising Sun, and uh, uh, many, many games that I will not go through and mention. Uh, next to him, we have um, Erica Buris, um, who has done uh, Kodama 3D, which is currently on Kickstarter. Bosque, which is in the hot games area. I just learned Ghostbusters card game, a variety of games. Uh, next, we have uh, Richard Launius, who's a designer of Arkham Horror, Elder Signs, Defenders of the Realm, um, as, as a sampling of his work. And uh, lastly, we have uh, Sydney Engelstein. I forgot to ask your title. What's your title? <laughs> uh, I'm the product development and manufacturing at Indie Game Studios. Yes. So she does, uh, she's a game developer with uh, Indie Game Studios, which encompasses uh, indie boards and cards and um, struggled games <laughs> and action phase games. You probably want to use the microphone at some point. Uh, mostly talking. <laughs> uh, and she's also the, uh, the co-designer of uh, Space Cadets and uh, Space Cadets Die Stool and Survive Space Attack. <laughs> uh, so the, the first question, just to kind of frame it, um, uh, you know, the design landscape, the board game industry um, continues to, to grow in terms of the number of players, the number of the sales of the industry. Um, Last year, um, there were about 3,800 new board games that were released, um, and I think there were at least 1,000 new games that were introduced just at Essen, Spiele. Um, so uh, starting in the end with, with Richard, so what, in terms of a designer, does did that numbers, you know, in terms of the, the, the massive number of players and publishers coming in, is that, does that get you excited? Does that make you nervous? What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, the first Essen I ever won to, there was 34 new games introduced. <laughs> 34 new games introduced. 34, yes. that in 93. So it gives you kind of uh, insight into how this hobby has jumped Actually, I think I, I released three new games this spring, so you know, so I got 10% almost of uh, the games that were released in 93. So um, it's, it's incredible, the number of products that are coming out. Um, and because of that, I think uh, some of the really good games are being overlooked because you just can't keep up. And I think that, as a designer, is a little sad because... There are some great games out there that just don't have any traction after a little bit. So I think that's one of the, it's a, it's a benefit for players, but it's not a benefit for designers because there's some great games, I think, that are being overlooked. Eric, what are your, what are your thoughts on that, on the, kind of the general state? Yeah, so it, uh, yeah, it's simultaneously exciting and terrifying, of course, right? Um, there are a lot of industry uh, insiders um, talk about the, the, uh, the, the current state of the industry as being as something of a bubble, um, which I don't necessarily agree with. Um, uh, w w yes, we are creating a lot of new games a lot quickly, but uh, bubble, industry bubbles only, ex um, 
only really exist when there is artificial demand, right? And there is no artificial demand here. People want to play games. The, the, the number of games bought every year grows year after year after year. I think the number is somewhere between 5 and 15%, depending on what region you're talking about. So the, um, there's, we're very healthy. It's just that the supply, the number of games being made, is increasing really, really quickly. Richard's right. There's a lot of games that are passed over. Um, it's, it's the state of the market. Like We're a mature market now. And uh, with, with a very low barrier to entry, it's very easy to get a game into publication. Um, and especially with Kickstarter, you can, you can sort of bypass the vetting process of, uh, that publishers used to offer. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 but of course, on the other hand, there's, a, there's, so, many cool, there's so many cool games out there. Um, as, as a avid game buyer and uh, enthusiast, I'm really excited. Um, I can go to any con. I, uh, I was at a con three weeks before this, and I played like I saw twenty new, at least twenty new games I never uh, never seen. Came to Dice Tower Con, I saw at least twenty new games today. Just going through the exhibit hall, um, it's yeah, it's overwhelming, but I'm generally optimistic and excited about it. Yeah, I mean, I think we've all seen the increase of games. Like me myself, I've only been working within the industry for just over three years at this point. But even within that time, I will say I've had to constantly adjust the way that I thought about how a game is presented. Um, part of competition is, to, I guess there's a good and bad of it, is the good is that you have to really, really start to hone your skills and make sure that that is something that is going to stand out. But then the bad of it is, if it doesn't stand out enough, even if it is, these guys were talking about is a great game, all of a sudden it's disappeared. Um, there are games that are amazing that are not even being seen because maybe they don't have the same table presence. Maybe they don't have the right influencers talking about them. There's so many factors that would not necessarily have been a factor previously that are huge impact creators right now. And so it's going to be really interesting kind of see where this goes forward. Okay. Richard? Now, you've, you know, you've been around the industry for a long time as yes. well, like Richard. So we have two Richards. He, he's and saying Eric and Erica. Yeah. Richard's, it's yeah, it's that's really that's bad planning on my part. I apologize. Yeah, but, no, uh, no, that, that, that's true. And by the way, I, I, I agree with Eric. It is not a bubble in the industry, okay? It is a paradigm shift. You know, I came out of uh, uh, yeah, an environment where I worked for AT AT&T for years in Yellow Pages, and, you know, when the Internet came out, that was a paradigm shift because we sold Yellow Pages. Guess what? Who, you don't need any more is Yellow Pages, okay? <laughs> so you can buy advertising all over the place. And we talked about it as, well, maybe this is a bubble. It's not a bubble. It's that the industry changes. I think what that means to us is, as everybody says, there's good things, there's bad things associated to that. But, but one of the things that's absolutely factual is the life expectancy of a game has diminished significantly, whether that's because there's too many coming out and it doesn't get seen. And, it, and a lot of the times it may have something to do with the quality of the game, but usually it doesn't. There's just so many games coming out. If you go to a game night somewhere, almost everybody that comes will have a bag full of new games. And when they come a week or two weeks later, they'll have another bag full of new games. They don't play like we used to, where we play the same game you know, several times and, and get to be experts at that game and, and pull it out still you know, monthly or whatever and play it. So that time period's gone. And what that means to us, I think, as game designers is we're not going to see near as many evergreen games getting printed and reprinted and reprinted, which is the stable of, you know, of, of how we make money, obviously, which kind of, to some degree, I'd use the analogy, it makes us sharecroppers. We, we design games, we put them out there, we make enough money to, to design another game. Uh, and that's something that's new to the industry, at least for, from my experience over the past five years, that's become new, so. Yeah. Yeah, uh, as Richard was saying, the uh, quantity of evergreens, games that would have been evergreens, you know, even five years ago these days can't cut through the noise and from a public publisher perspective uh, rather than a player perspective, the risk for board games is going up because even a solid game cannot find its place in the market so easily these days with, with so much saturation. I was just at Origins and I do a lot of acquisitions and I sat down for like 80 prototypes in five days and so many of them uh, you know, try to give some feedback to the designer where they can go with it. And so many of them, the feedback was, no, you've made a good game. It's a good game, but it's just not special enough to cut through all the noise that's in the industry these days. It's not going to be a sparkly enough because 
hundreds and hundreds of games come out every week. Um, and so a, a good game sometimes isn't good enough anymore. And I think that's one of the problems of the oversaturation of the market that, you know, everything has to be better than it had to be five years ago in order to, to matter. Yeah, and, you know, to echo that, um, I always tell people, you know, I've been in the industry and collecting games for a long time, and back in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, you know, as, as a board game player, interested in Euro games and stuff like that, you could buy every game that came out. You could, you know, and we were talked about, we were, I was having a discussion with somebody about, like, how Ticket to Ride became as popular as it was, and it was because every single person knew it was coming out and knew who Alan Moon was and could buy that game, right? It was so... That was one of the reasons why, uh, and it's a great game, but there's a lot of great games that some catch on and some don't. Um, so Eric, from a, from a publisher perspective, uh, I, uh, in terms of deciding which games you're going to do, you know, how do you, are, are there certain things that, that you're looking for that you think are gonna, are, are gonna cut through and, and, and step up and make uh, games from, come on, you know, attract that audience? Oh yeah, uh, I could do a panel about that. But um, the so we have a, we have a saying inside um, inside Come On, which is which is my saying. It's it's. I hope it doesn't come off cynical. It doesn't mean to be. But our saying is like, good is the new bad, and um, like showing us a good game is great. But um, it's we have to evaluate the same we would have evaluated a bad game before. We can't publish it. And um, what <clears throat> what so I won't. I won't I'll talk in more generalities than what uh, than what Kaman is looking for. Um, if any time, if you have a, if, if you have a game, if you look at our game Gizmos and our upcoming game Foodies, if you have a game that that can fit into that family, come see me. I'll I'll give you some quick feedback. No problem. Um, generally speaking, I um, I feel like you have to do either one of two things in order to break through the noise. Either number one, you've got to build the uh, you have to build the absolute objectively best mouse trap, um, which means if you are if you're making a game that's been done a hundred times before in the last couple of years, like I'm going to make a worker placement game, and that's and that's your twist. That's fine, but that better it better be the best damn worker placement game that's ever been made. Otherwise, why why put the, why play that instead of the 50 others that came out last week? Um, best mousetrap still works. There's still room for that in in the market. Um, I, I many of the hot games in that uh, right now are not necessarily groundbreaking or new. They're just best in class uh, for what they are. The other, um, the other is to do something um, uh, so innovative and mind blowing that regardless of um, regardless of whether it's, I almost want to say regardless of whether it's even good or not, it'll get people talking. Uh, Keyforge is a great example of that, right? I remember when Fantasy Flight um, first spoiled Keyforge. The whole internet was a buzz about it, right? They were like, I, and a lot of the buzz was, well, how does this even work? Like, is this any good? I don't know. That's that's great, right? Um, and of course, it had the pet, uh, amazing pedigree behind it. Richard Garfield's amazing. Fantasy Flight is amazing. Um, that helps a lot. We look for games like that. I look for games that that, um, and we can only publish a small number of those every couple of years. But I look for games that make, that like wake me up, open um, that go, wow, I haven't played anything like this before, and in a while, and it makes me it it asks it poses some new questions about gaming, right? The Mind was a great example from a couple, year, uh, a couple years ago. Was it really last year? <laughs> TikTok, I'm old. Um, the, the, uh, yeah, I mean, the, um, and because of that, I got obsessed with it, right? And uh, a lot of people did get obsessed with it because it had that new spark, that new quality that made you just view games slightly askance. That's sort of what I'm looking for. Of course, I'm always looking for good games. I'm always looking for solid stuff, but I'm really looking for either best in class or something, something just different enough to get me asking questions. So, Richard um, Borg, I guess I need to. I need to. Uh, <laughs> That's fine. We need to come up with with nicknames for people. Um, so you you know, uh, kind of established a, a, a genre or a, a series game, you know, with command and colors. Um, so it's, you know, it's, you don't, I, I don't feel like we see as many series games. I, so I was just kind of curious in terms of when you're designing in a series and how you feel that that works for, you know, try, do you try trying to it's build an audience or getting an audience? Was that? It's a lot easier to sell a series of games once yeah. the once you sell the core game and you've got enough core games out there, you can sell 
half as many for the next expansion and then maybe half as many for the next one. Um, some of the commands and color stuff actually broke that rule, though, pretty much uh, if you go up to GMT and look at some of the games I have with them, they basically sell as many core games as they do expansions. And some of the things like Napoleonics and Ancients, we've sold like five different expansions for the base game. So those are loyal customers. And if you can find loyal customers as a designer, you're going all right because you know that the next expansion, you're going to sell another 5,000 to 10,000 copies of that game. Yeah. Plus also the core game will sell because the consumer will come off, they'll buy the new one, find some new players to play it with, and they'll go and buy the core game. So I'm very lucky that we have some very strong games that do that. Now, we have a new game called Red Alert from Plastic Soldier Company. Now, the, the way they did it was a little different. They released a core game, and they released six expansions right away at the same time. So you didn't even have to wait for the expansion. Some of the other ones, you have to wait six months, a year, whatever. And uh, it works. It works um, from a designer's point. It's an easy sell. That's what I work on a lot now. Um, try to go into the new market with a new idea. A lot of times it's very difficult. And jump back to Red Alert. We'll talk about you got to have something different, too. We have a massive board. You got to remember the old uh, Battle Masters, the old game. Yeah. Hasbro had it had this giant mat with a lot of figures. Well, the Red Alert is basically the same. It's a space fleet battle game. It's got a giant map. Probably can't play it on your kitchen table. It'll hang over the sides or dining room table. But it's got like 90 plus miniatures in it. And that's the other thing too. I'm, you know, this company here does a very good job of selling miniatures as well as games. You know, they're, 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 they, they have more cool minis in a game. And sometimes, or I know a lot of guys that buy it just because it's the miniatures. They don't care much about the gameplay. The miniatures are so cool, right? That, used, uh, that definitely used to be the case. It's, it, that's becoming, I mean, now there's so many publishers that make great minis, it's become less of the case lately. Um, but yeah, there are definitely, I mean... The, but that still gets some notice it's on the uh, Kickstarter and absolutely. stuff. Oh, yeah, man, yeah, absolutely. Oh, man, huge. So... For me, it's a luck. I, I've been very lucky that, that I've had a couple of good series. Commands and Colors works very well. Um, it goes from simple to very complex. Um, we're very lucky that we stumbled on that idea, and we're kind of milking the heck out of it, aren't okay, we? That's great. <laughs> so, so, Richard, you... Uh, other Richard, sorry. <laughs> Richard. <Yeah. laughs> You've, when you're designing, or do you look to how can I do expansions for this game? I mean, is that, is that something that you feel is a selling point when you're bringing it to, uh, to, to a publisher? Because I know a lot of your designs have been expanded and have had that. Is that something you're trying to no, build but, hooks No, but when that? I'm designing a game, a lot of times I'll begin to design a lot more pieces than I think will fit in the base game, either mm -hmm. for one of two reasons. Either I don't want the base game to be so complex, right off the bat they play the hardest thing possible. I know, I, I feel that way now when I order some Kickstarter stuff and I get five boxes of stuff in, it, it's overwhelming, okay? And, and I start looking through it and, you know, what, what part of this do I play? So when I design a game, what I'll do a lot of times if, I'm, if, if I am putting any expansion stuff together, I will tell the company right off the bat, I think all this stuff over here could be an expansion in the future. I think this is your base game. You, you guys need to be the ones that decide that, but you know this material could go. And then a lot of times I, I don't have any expansion ideas, but after the game comes out and I play it a few times, I start thinking, you know what? This would be good if I would add this or whatever. So I, I think one of the things with me is I do big games and I do thematic games. And when you do big thematic games, you have room to, to put more story into them, to put more theme into them. Mm -hmm. So they lend themselves to expansions more. That's just my feeling. I, I yeah. think Kickstarter has become a big factor in that too because it's now this ex expectation of additional content. It's almost seen as like the Kickstarter is, is not as good as the rest if it doesn't have all these stretch goals. When, to be honest, most stretch goals are just things that the designer has already created and just kind of said, oh, we'll make it a stretch goal now, even though realistically they might have included it in the game in the first place. Um, but there's, there's a lot of expectations and now. To, to tag on to that, there's a problem if it's on 
Kickstarter and all of a sudden they start telling you they want additional stuff uh, right off the bat and they're promising things that haven't been designed or tested yet or whatever. My, my opinion is that's where some of these Kickstarter projects, you know, run astray. Uh, one of the more popular ones, and I can think back to one of them, I won't, I won't name the game, but the game was designed, it was really solid with four players. They wanted it to be five players on Kickstarter. So it's going to be five players. Okay, so we started working on a five player. Then they got all excited because they were making more money. How many of you will buy it if there's six players? All of a sudden it's six players. And, and the game came out and it was an absolute bomb, okay? And the reason it was a bomb because people played it with six players. And the game went forever, okay? But with four players, that game just hummed. And so I, I'm not over. I'm not a big fan of additional stuff on uh, as as rewards on Kickstarter. Uh, to my opinion, is anything that's being added should be part of the base game, or it doesn't belong to be part of the game at all. That's just my general opinion about how to put things into games. So, yeah. uh, okay, Erica, did you have any further thoughts around that? that's important to just pay attention to is when we see a game coming out there could be all of this extra stuff slapped on because the publisher thinks they have to it's flashier it's shinier it's going to attract more people it's you know people are going to try to get their friends because like oh but we want to unlock this thing you know and as, as Richard's saying it's like well it'd just be nice if it just came with it but I don't know if that's what people want to see anymore because the other thing is a lot of the market is driven by what the consumers want and so if publishers think that this is going to be flashier for the consumer probably going to do it even if maybe it's not always the best thing for the game um, it's trying to uh, we've been talking a lot about competition competition is a huge thing right now how do you make somebody look at your game how do you make somebody look at your kickstarter and so you're going to see more and more maybe interesting wacky unconventional whatever it is ways which is positive in some ways because uh, I mean the game design industry really hasn't figured out marketing and advertising the way they should yet and this might force them to do that because traditional doesn't work here so you have to go alternative if you have to go alternative it takes more time but you have to get more creative about it um, so I think that'll be a positive way in that sense but we're also going to see this let's throw everything in the kitchen sink at something because that's how I'm going to market my game look at all the stuff it comes with well that's not necessarily marketing that's just Add-ons and getting a few new miniatures or another character stuff. That's one thing getting a whole new game design Okay um, That maybe has been or has not been tested as full yeah. as it should have been that that's a different Story <laughs> always gets a little bit scary. So so Sydney so um, from Perspective of, of indie and you know with stronghold in their games um, when you, you said you looked at like 80 games at Origins, so are you looking for games that have potential for expansion or something? Is that one of the criteria that you're um, looking at? Because I know like Eon's End has Aeon, been, yeah. well, Aeon's End has been very good for your company and that in terms of you have that loyal audience and you can keep going. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, so a company, you know, a big company like Indie Game Studios that actually um, has games like Aeon's End that have a set audience sort of relies on that game uh, to keep generating revenue. You know, every single year we're going to come out with a big box Aeon's End expansion because that funds every other game, you know, that we're taking a chance on uh, from an unknown uh, designer, unknown audience. Uh, we couldn't do those if we didn't have Aeon's End, if we didn't have Terraforming Mars generating um, you know one big Kickstarter a year to cover those costs um, but for for games that were being pitched at cons you know new games games from unknown designers uh, expansion content is not very important in fact a lot of people come up and they're pitching the game and like the second thing they say is I already have five expansions lined up and I'm like dude <laughs> come, take a deep breath and calm down because you need to sell the base game first if people aren't already hooked onto that IP if they aren't already interested the, com the publishing company is not going to put the money into the production costs of you know releasing it with a bunch of expansions they need to decide if the base game stands on its own and if it hits and lands with its mark it, then you can come back and, and go into expansion content to try and keep those people that you uh, caught with the base game. But just for a pitch meeting, uh, expansion content is so far away from, from what we're thinking about at that point because we need to make sure that the original game is going to you know pay for itself before we can think about investing in, in further, uh, in further um, additions. Okay. So talking about Kickstarter, um, I think that's 
I think we would all agree that that's been one of the elements that has really fueled the growth of the number of titles that have come out over the last several years. Um, I've been saying for at least six or seven years now on my, my, whenever I do my annual state of the game address that, that people are going to wake up and stop using Kickstarter. <laughs> but uh, so far that hasn't happened. Um, but um, <laughs> I'm sure you're all happy that I have not been right with that, with that prediction. Um, but um, I, has Kick, Kickstarter has sort of been changing. Um, you know, I, I don't think we see as many of you know kind of the blockbusters, and it's you know it can get harder for games to get traction. Kickstarter has been getting a little bit more aggressive about enforcing their terms of service. Um, Kanama 3D, I guess, was taken down for a little bit and then put back up. Um, Colossal Games recently had an issue with a bunch of their games getting pulled down from Kickstarter. Um, do you feel that Kickstarter right now is is it still kind of an essential part of the game industry? Is it becoming more important? Is it becoming less important? Um, you know, Eric, do you want to talk about that uh, from from your perspective? Eric, sure. We'll start with Eric. Sure. Um, uh, so. It's going to be hard for me to speak about Kickstarter too objectively, of course, right? Being uh, as a game director of Kaman uh, who relies heavily on Kickstarter. So, um, however, I'm also a fan. I'm, I'm first and foremost a game fan. I, uh, a gamer, a game fan. I go out and I buy a lot of games and I spend a lot of time studying the industry. Uh, I think Kickstarter is, um, it's more relevant today than it's ever been. And like, when I say Kickstarter, I mean crowdfunding, right? Um, there's also Indiegogo and other stuff, but that, but. Uh, it's, I think it's more relevant. It's, it changed the industry irrevocably as far as I'm concerned uh, when as soon as, uh, as, as soon as like, I guess, Zombicide and other games like that that started becoming really big and started um, and generated a roadmap for success for that kind of game. That it's, it's so transparent. Everybody can see how you can succeed in games like that. So it's an easy formula to copy. Um, it's, and it's also um, like the... I think philosophically, the idea of the Kickstarter campaign has become refined enough to be uh, an ex a marketing experience in and of itself. Uh, come on, for uh, our like, I know we get a lot of flack for like, oh, why'd you guys kickstart this when you're a big publisher? I mean, for us, Kickstarter is a marketing event, right? We um, it helps cut through the noise and uh, and really involve. It's a bottom-up marketing event. We involve the backers and the players in the marketing event, get their feedback, get their enthusiasm, and it's um, because our industry. Erica made a really good point. Our industry is really bad at data. Um, we don't have we don't have advanced marketing to uh, data collection analytics uh, at all, um, or, or centralization. So we basically have to we have to judge from our own based on our own heuristics how well a game is doing how better than to actually interact live with the audience. So the Kickstarter event is what we call it internally. Uh, Kickstarter events are huge. They will always be huge. Yes, no, no individual game is going to make as much as it used to. They're just like in, just like the retail side of it, there's the, the demand is going up 10 to 15%. Output is going up a hundred percent. That means like math tells you it's going to, everybody's going to get a slightly smaller piece of the pie. Um, I think Kickstarter is going to evolve a little bit um, in some surprising ways, um, some which I can't talk about, but uh, some which are easy to speculate about. Um, you notice that uh, Kickstarter games are doing a lot more pre-marketing than they used to, right? Because the big day one is really important. So you'll see for a lot of Kickstarter games, like they're actually they're spending the lots of social media dollars and print dollars and advertising dollars for that launch date. Right, we talk. Uh, come on, we talk about our launch dates about a month in advance and get everybody excited about that day one launch. We didn't have to do that before. Kickstarter, like launching the game, was the marketing. Um, that's going to continue to evolve and change. And uh, and I think the, the 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 fan base on Kickstarter has become super savvy. Right, you can't really fool them anymore. You can't just put up a couple pretty images and like half a rule book and go like, trust us, this game is awesome. Uh, there's too much choice, so you have to do you have to do a great job on a Kickstarter game to succeed, and I think that's going to continue. That bar is going to keep ri ri rising and rising and rising, and the cream will rise to the top. I think. Erica, you had some. I was going to say I think there's areas where Kickstarter is going to have to change, so it's good to hear that maybe they're in the right way because I feel like they're going to 
If they don't change, I think they're going to slowly phase themselves out because if you think about like when a when a game uh, let's put it there, when a player wants to go on to Kickstarter and actually purchase a game, what they're really asking for is a pre-ordering system. That is not what Kickstarter is, and that's not what they want to be unless they're changing this. What that ends up being is is some of the stuff that we're now coming down the pipes, where it's like enforcing it here but not there. Um, there is a big lack of communication from them. So it would be interesting to see if there's anyone who, I mean, to be honest, if somebody could build up essentially where it was a pre-ordering system, but it still had the must be funded to actually be executed kind of thing, there would be, if it was especially game focused, all you'd need is about three large companies moving over to that platform, announcing it at once, and that would be kind of it for Kickstarter. And so what will be interesting to see is we, right now, none of us would listen to that unless those big companies moved over. So it's amazing how much power those companies are going to have if these other platforms start to pop up. And that will be really interesting for then consumers too and then game designers on how this is going to be sold because we're using Kickstarter as gamers, not the way it's intended to be used. So the question will become, is someone going to fill that in instead and provide that service more appropriately? That's just my future speculation. Yeah, on a similar point, the, the funding goals, I think, isn't even a necessary part of it. So many, I feel like, game projects, the funding goal is mostly abstract because the company already knows it's going to fund, and it's just more about you know what number you hit and how many people are interested in it, and the funding goal is just picked somewhere abstractly low uh, so that uh, it works under Kickstarter's like uh, algorithms and everything. Uh, so some sort of pre-order system that includes promos and um, content that you can't get in retail, which I feel like is why most gamers, you know, go to Kickstarter, uh, could definitely stand in um, for what we have right now. But that kind of mass migration to a new site, it's terrifying because you don't have the the uh, people. Um, knowing about it, you know, you're going to lose a lot of people in the transition, and I wonder how long it would take for big companies to, you know, agree to that sort of uh, migration. Yeah, and GMT Games, and maybe Richard, you could speak to this a little bit with their P500 program. They kind of have their own sort of internal Kickstarter idea um, that, that that they've made work very well. I really can't comment too much on the, the Kickstarter because I really don't get involved in it, although I do have product on that. Um, GMT does a P500 pre-order. When they get 500 orders, supposedly it goes into uh, the queue, so they start working on artwork, et cetera. Um, it's really about 750 orders before they actually even consider doing the game. But uh, P500 just has been around a while. Costs have gone up, so... It's now 750, but um, but yeah, the they have their own um, own Kickstarter, as it were, or the way that they can solve which games they're gonna publish. Yeah, and it literally saved the uh, saved the company years ago. They were having a lot of cash flow issues, and and they don't charge anybody till they're actually shipping the game. So it's it's a different model for them. So what I'd like to do now is open it up to questions. Um, so if you have questions about the state of the industry in general, or just game design questions that you'd like to ask, we'd certainly be happy with those. So do we have any questions? Yes. Thank you, sir. You know that guy? OK, I asked a question last time. <laughs> Sorry, it's me again. Um, so my question, I, I think it was brought up just very briefly, but in terms of IP. And in my experience, I've worked with one publisher who is all about IPs. The, you know, most of their projects are based on popular IPs. And I'm also working with a publisher who has the exact opposite stance, uh, that IPs are just not worth the amount of royalties that you have to pay to use IPs. It, they take too much of the margin and so forth. But uh, because I'm only seeing the two extremes, I wanted to kind of get an idea of what, uh, what the panelists feel is sort of like the current state of like the way IPs are used, how much value do they add to the final product, and how much marketing, do you, marketing value do you get from it? 
Richard, would you like, do you have any Can we thoughts? just develop this question just a little bit, just for, for uh, Absolutely. To, to, just to clarify? Sure. Um, so when you're talking about IP, when Emerson, uh, Emerson, by the way, who's a uh, uh, highly talented designer, works, uh, designed uh, Century Spice Rose, Century Golem, Century Silk, Century <laughs> Millennium, all that. Century, Century. Um, it, um, we, we're talking about IP. Talking about, I, I, you're, what you're talking about is uh, licensed, licensed games off of big media IPs you're talking yes, about. Yes, that's right? Yeah, like a Star Wars game or a Marvel right. game so, or like, something exactly. like that. So you're asking, you're asking about like how how much is it worth to pay the the, the huge amount of royalties and costs for to get a big IP like Star Wars or Avatar or whatever versus right. developing your own internal IP for a game system. That is correct. All right, developed. <laughs> Richard, you well, know? I've done some IP games for companies. What I'll tell you as a designer, you're gonna make less money. Okay, I'll tell you that right sure. off the bat. Big factor. It's a and like uh, that. I did a Marvel game, which you know I don't know much Marvel's making, but it's a heck of a lot more than I'm making. I can tell you that much <laughs> on that one. <laughs> Uh, and and even when you know like Batman the animated, it's it's just less money than you'd make if if the game was published with a non IP. So uh, it's kind of fun to do IP, especially if you you love the product that you're doing and you want to do that. You know you want to do that a service. Uh, you know uh, Planet of the Apes uh, I did on the first movie, which I, I I really enjoy that game and think I did you know kind of honored the movie quite a bit. Didn't I don't know if it did that well in, in sales. Certainly didn't make me that much money, but uh, I think they're fun to do from that perspective. So if you really love the theme you're getting to do, it's great. As a designer, I'll tell you, you're, you're, you're never going to make as much money, at least from my perspective, on an IP product. You don't uh, think the IP will expand sort of like your market to, you'll, you'll get less in terms of the royalties um, for A lot the of times they won't pay royalties. A lot of times if you're doing an IP, they just want to pay you a fat, flat rate because they're paying too much in royalties you know, elsewhere. So uh, it gets, that one, that one gets kind of iffy. The other thing with IPs is depending on who has the IP, uh, they get a lot of say, and it means it's going to slow down the, the, the project. I mean, yeah, the, the Marvel game I did two years ago, and um, hopefully come out this year, but, but maybe still come out next year. Marvel gets final say on everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now that's Disney, so that makes it even worse. So. <laughs> From a, from a publisher standpoint also, obviously, IP can be a huge selling point and, you know, if it's a mass market game, that's also a huge selling point, like if you can get into Target or Barnes & Noble, but yeah. some publishing companies have the infrastructure and have the connections to get those IPs and some just don't, you know, they're not set up in ways to go after them and it would be more trouble and more money and more headache than, you know, the potential of the game is worth. So I think if you have a game that you think would be really great with IP, doing the research on what company could support that, you know, because there are definitely some companies who'd be like, oh, it's a Star Wars game? Great. We cannot help you with that, you know, <laughs> uh, because it's just so difficult to get IP sometimes uh, if you don't have those connections already in place. I'll just add, um, three of the four games I'm working on right now are IP, and what's interesting is, is that I think, especially where the publishers are going, is that you already have the built-in fan base, so they're assuming that is who's buying the game, but then the question becomes, then will people outside of that fan base buy the game? Mm -hmm. And that's become, I think that in itself is its own struggle, because oftentimes when you're doing an IP game, you have to be really, really careful that most, depending on the, the IP itself, most of the time you're actually going, aiming a bit more towards either intro gamers or gateway mm -hmm. games. And the minute you did that, did you cut out hobby in some way? Did you do this? Are you going to hobby so you cut out the mass? Like there's such a fine line to walk with a lot of the IPs that it's, I think it's a lot of publishers looking at like the short term sales, not the long term sales. It's a huge boost to that community. They'll all buy it, but they don't really expect it to keep going. And because the other thing people don't think about is that a lot of licenses you have to continue. So if they don't continue the license, that game is dead. That's it. Whatever was left, that's done. And that's a whole other factor. So I think it is the short-term games versus long-term ones that are happening right now, especially with IP. But that's why, as Richard was saying, you have to love it. If you don't love the sandbox you're playing in, you might not make what you might make on something you purely made on your own. right? So if you don't love the IP, don't say yes. <laughs> right? And do it because you're a fan. Because it might not be that huge selling game. It's just going to satisfy fans, potentially. I well, think also in general, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's hard for a designer to just on their own design a game for an IP and then go to a publisher and say, hey, I have a game. Can you get the license for this? 
Um, I think typically it's the other way around that the yeah. publisher yeah. tries to get the, gets licensed first and then solicits designs around that. 99.9%. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. only yeah. a couple yes. companies that have IPs that are sitting with. So if you're pitching a game, they might say, oh, this would work for that IP. But right. it's yeah. more that type of thing. Uh, even even on the topic of IP itself, there's room for nuance, right? Um, so like all IPs are not created equal. And even internally at Come On, um, we... we uh, we segregate IPs when, when we're evaluating them into tiers, right? There's tier one IP, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Ever, Perennials, Evergreens, even, they don't have to be, uh, and, um, and there's tier two. We have four tiers of IP, and of course I'm not going to say what, how we rank them, but even then, <laughs> well, but even then there's another vector that we looked at, which is uh, perennial or uh, trend, right? And that's, that's a big difference too, right? For a while, um, when Pokemon came out uh, in uh, 90. Eight. Uh, when when Nintendo first licensed it to Wizards of the Coast, it was considered a trend, right? Um, it, and it was marketed and developed as a trend as something they thought was going to go away. Turns out it's a perennial, um, but um, like Tamagotchi is a trend, right? Even though it's huge, it's a tier one, but it was a trend. Um, all those games are should have to be designed, developed, and produced and marketed differently, and uh, then you run the risk of being wrong. But uh, if you don't, if you, in my opinion, if you don't think about that, if you don't think about it that way, um, you run the risk of work doing a lot of work on IP and not making a lot of money. Um, and of course, sorry, the third vector is saturation, right? Most IPs are not, uh, mo most IP holders do not give out exclusive licenses, especially not the big ones. Marvel, Star Wars, there's a reason why there's 100,000 Star Wars games out there because they will, nothing is exclusive. So you then you have to think about like, uh, not only uh, is the IP worth it, but am I carving enough of a segment in that IP? Am I offering a new enough experience to appeal to that fan base while not cutting off, while not putting myself into such a niche that we're only appealing to people who like the IP and like that type of game and cutting everybody else out? Uh, it's it's a tough thing. We could do a whole panel on that. We should do a whole panel. Let's do that next year. Okay. Um, Stay till one o'clock. One o'clock to two o'clock. We'll talk about it. It's a it's a big topic. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's an, an interesting topic. topic. And it's so it's, um, in my opinion, anybody who tells you gives you a yes or no answer to it has not thought it through enough. It's a it's super complicated yeah. issue. I was also really intrigued. I was in the um, I, the giant Disney store in Disney Springs, and uh, they have a little game section, but they just have like. Pirates of the Caribbean, Battleship, uh, you know, they have those kind of games. They did not, I was looking for vil Villainous. I thought the Villainous game, which has done very well in general, but it seemed like a perfect product to have, and, they're, and they are not having it. You cannot buy it in, Dis in any of the Disney stuff. It might be oh, is it a Target exclusive? Okay. Okay. Well, I withdraw that comment then. <laughs> but there's no, the, no FFG games. We're in like the Star Wars stores and stuff like that, for well, sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, next other question? Um, can you talk as a publisher a little bit about w why you would like to sell online and get a higher margin versus going in a Target and is going into a big retail store or smaller retail stores? Kind of what what do you see as your biggest um, revenue producer? And, and is it worth going into those places and then they can kind of do what they want with your pricing and that sort of thing? Yeah, I think just in general channels, I think is an interesting question. There's, there's certainly been some controversy with online retailers versus right. stores versus minim, you know, holding a map, minimum advertising price and, and Amazon and all that stuff. So, uh, I work for a publicly traded company, so I can't really, uh, some of this falls under tradecraft. I can't really talk about philosophically, but we can talk in general, I think, uh, not about our company, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you've got some insight into that. <laughs> you want to talk about it? You're on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so also being vague, vague enough that I don't get in trouble, uh, we signed a game recently and we were sort of at a crossroads with it because it could go very mass market kind of target game or we could, you know, develop it a little and make it m appeal more to the hobby. Um, and, you know, more towards kids, more towards adults. We weren't sure which we preferred. And um, in the end, uh, a lot of it came down to what do we as a company 
have the built-in infrastructure for. We have the audience in the hobby market. We don't have an audience in the mass market. We don't yet have relationships with Target or other mass market stores that we do have relationships with, you know, um, uh, distributors uh, to hobby shops and uh, we have Kickstarter infrastructure we have um, places at cons you know the people we can reach as a company are far more in the hobby uh, games industry so even if you know Target can be a really profitable um, you know, place to get a game first of all we'd have to see about getting it into Target you can't just decide you're going to put a game in Target but um, because we have a built-in audience for hobby games, it lends us towards trying to market our games at those same people. Um, and we you know, try and sign games that will appeal to those people who already like our style of board games because we know we can reach their ear. They're listening to us and we can say, you will also like this game and that's the kind of trust you build up. Versus if we were to you know, strike out and produce a kid's game for the mass market, it could be great, but it's also a much higher risk because we don't have the built-in um, audience already. We would have to be finding the audience and hoping that they enjoy the game enough that they would um, support it. Yeah. Because it's Dice Tower Con, I keep, we often forget that we're, like, we're not at a trade show. It might actually be worth, it might be worth doing a, like, a quick 101 on how the industry works like what the channels of the industry actually are for, from sure. after design. <laughs> Show of hands, people interested in that. Is anybody interested in that boring technical? Like, <laughs> okay. How does your Go ahead. Oh, me? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Sure. <laughs> okay, so, well, companies can sell direct. So there are some that do sell directly off of their website and stuff like that. Um, but most games are sold through distribution. So they'll go to a company like Alliance or PSI. There's, there's a few of them out there. Um, we can talk also is another interesting topic about what's happening in the distribution area and, uh, and where that's going in the future. But typically a company will sell the game to a distributor and then the distributor will sell it to the store who will sell it to the public. Um, and there's, you know, there's, there's a step at there. So like a game that costs like, you know, $8 to manufacture, maybe it'll be sold to distribution for $15 and the distributor will sell it for $25 to the store and the store will sell it for $50 to you. So something like that is, is typically the way that the chain goes. So obviously, if you can make a game for $8 and sell it for 50 directly, you're going to do a lot better. And there are some companies um, like um, uh, uh, Tim Fowers, their, their company, uh, with uh, Burgle Brothers and, and those games, they only sell direct because he's like, it's going to be a smaller print run, so I might as well maximize what it is. But you're going to limit the number of copies that you can sell. That way people have to find you on your website or whatever. They don't sell through Amazon or any place like that. Um, and then when you get into your mass markets, you get into Barnes & Noble, you get into Targets and stuff like that, you're usually selling to them direct. They'll usually buy... Um, you know, like I know some Target exclusive games, you know, as part of the exclusive, it was a minimum of like 40 to 50,000 copies. 100 to 200,000 copies, yeah. Yeah, so, so it's a different Do magnitude. They... Whereas like a typical print run for a hobby game is like 3,000 copies. So just to give you some kind of a range. Do, does Target, if you don't sell them, do you have to buy them back or do they just purchase them and depends if, on if the you're deal. small enough yep yeah. yeah and target will dictate prices on you too so if you can't make your game a low enough price it's not going there anyway yeah yeah hey, I know there's somebody, so many things that come with that yeah i i know a company that uh that did a target exclusive game and target went to them and said look this game needs to be 25 dollars we're gonna we're gonna sell it for 25 dollars and you know and they told me normally that type of a game with those type of components they would sell for 40 or 50 but because they got the exclusive and you know, that it was 50,000 copies instead of 5,000 copies, they decided that it was worthwhile and, and went ahead and did it. I don't know about the returns and stuff like the, that. The margins are also a little better because, um, you know, if you, if it costs $8 to produce 3,000, you know, eight, eight per unit when you're printing 3,000, when you're printing 50,000, it's more like $3 a unit. So your price margins do get better if you're going into... A target where they're where you're doing a fifty thousand print run instead of a three thousand print run, you can make it cheaper, but it's still you know a balancing act. Yeah. Okay, so we have time. Yes, Richard. one of the things that uh, we did a couple of years ago was a Yahtzee free for all, and I mean the Target had it okay. for, uh, and Thank they you. bought two hundred thousand copies from Bill Bradley or Hasbro. So I mean that's the quantity. 
the numbers that they buy are ridiculous when they want to exclusive some big mass market company. So you get 200,000 copies that going into Target, that's a pretty good deal. But uh, after one year, it died. I mean, so it's just, it's just that quick turnaround. So, yeah. But yeah, they, it's, it's, and as far as a designer, I, I took a, a cut on my royalty because it was Yahtzee. But, you know, 300,000 copies after it was sold, sun and down, that's... Okay. We call that sure. scale. Uh, yep. One of, one of the things Eric and I talk about all the time, we design games for yucks or we design games for bucks. And sometimes if you can get into a mass market game, even with a license, we talked about licenses a little bit before, you get a licensed product and you sell 300,000 copies, even if you're making 1% on it, it's still probably going to be better than 20,000 copies at 8%. Okay. So I don't know which of you, someone out there angered Richard Launius, so, so he stormed off. Uh, so I did, didn't get a chance to thank you for the panel, but we do have time for just one final question. Who's got the absolute best question? The best question. The best. It's got to be a mass market. It's got to be question. you. It's got to be Daryl. This is not the best question, but it... <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm curious, because everyone up there is designers. Uh, do you try to design uh, kind of in your wheelhouse, like you have a, a, an audience that likes your games, or do you try to uh, design diverse... Uh, just everyone on the panel, if you're willing to say a word. Different games. I mean, I've done quite a different bunch of games, card games, a lot of mass market games, a lot of, a lot of games you don't know that I design. I mean, Commands of Colors, people know because it's a hobby game and you guys are hobby gamers. Maybe you don't even know Commands of Colors and stuff, but um, but I do a lot of mass market games, too. They never have my name on them. They don't put your name on it if you sell it to Hasbro or to Milton yeah. Bradley or what, any of those companies. I think that's important to note, too. A lot of people don't know that, that mass market, your name might not actually appear anywhere. If you're lucky, it's in the rule book. If you're not, it's... You told your friends, right? That's kind of how it works. We do a lot of, we've done a lot of movie games and stuff too, and they're just small print runs because the movie games usually do well when the movie comes out and dies, you know, shortly after it. By the time the DVD comes out, you can see it, the game is done. I feel like uh, for the board game industry, a name is not worth that much. It's worth a lot less than it is in other industries. There's a handful of designers out there who people, you know, maybe 40% of people looking at the game would recognize. That's being generous. And, uh, you know, so it's not as big a draw as, say, putting a famous actor in a movie is, you know, there aren't people who will just buy everything a designer has ever made. Um, and there's so many people who you know, won't recognize a famous designer's name on a game, so it won't make a difference, you know, if they liked their previous games or not. I, I don't design super often, so for me, it's just, if something is exciting to me, if it's something I want to be working on and something I would want to play, that's a good enough, you know, <laughs> excuse to design it. I don't try and get too caught up in a target audience or what I think is going to be popular. Um... Because it's just, it's not, it's, I don't think it's ever going to matter enough that it's worth me thinking that hard about. I don't think you'll ever see the same game for me twice. It's just not who I am. Um, for the most part, I look at design as like a creative challenge. So if I've already done something before, yes, you could become an expert at it. But what I'd like to do is I would like to experiment with a different theme, a different mechanic, a different... I want it new to me because I want to grow. And so the way I approach it then is that I want it to be something I have not done before. And so I don't think you'll see that much similarity between most of my games. Yeah. Just me. Eric, have you ever had a, a, a time when you had to design, you were like given a spec and here, this is what it is and this is what we need to design and you didn't really have the enthusiasm for it then? Oh yeah. <laughs> and how, so how do you carry through through the six, 12 month process, whatever it is to get that designed? Or is that just well, part of being the, a professional game designer? In those case, yeah, so uh, yucks and bucks, right? Uh, as as uh, Richard so succinctly put it. Uh, I don't do that anymore. I'm very blessed. I, I, I know only get to work on the games I love. But there was a period where um, there was a period where I, I, a fairly dry period where um, I needed to work on. Uh, I, 
to, to pull in a fair amount of money to get financial security. I went into consulting at that point, and I, used, I worked for the video game industry, uh, specifically Facebook. Remember back when Facebook made all those, uh, all those Facebook games, those uh, obligation clickers? <laughs> um, I worked on like 40 of those, I think. Um, one of them shipped, um, and it was, it was a grind. It was absolute grind, but it paid really, really well. And what, this is going to sound, in retrospect, it's going to sound a lot more deliberate and planned as it was, at, at, as I was feeling at the time, but um, intuitively I was at the point where I was like, you know what, I need, to, I need to generate a financial security so that I can work on games that I, only on games that I want to. Um, working on uh, tabletop games is not a lucrative affair, right? Um, if you, especially today, most games, when you're in the design period, um, take a year plus. At the end of the day, they're going to sell 3,000 copies. Uh, that's not going to, it's not going to pay for your car. It's not even going to pay your rent. Uh, so you have to do that. You have to do those for the love. And you, um, so I, I basically powered through and said, you know what? I'm doing this because I want to work on stuff that I love. So I'm going to spend a little bit of my time working on stuff that I don't necessarily love and find something in there. Uh, I did not. Uh, I burned out pretty hard and then I came back to tabletop and I've never looked back since. Uh, however, uh, given the opportunity to do it again, I absolutely would because I owe my financial freedom to it. Okay. So thank you so much to the panel. Thank you all. Um, just r going down quickly, uh, Richard, any uh, new projects or things that uh, people can be looking out for here? Or if they want to get in touch with you? and We have, uh, sorry, I'm going to plug my Red Alert game again. Please. Uh, that Red Alert game is... Uh, it's an expensive game, man. It's you know, hundred and some dollars, and that's an expensive game. Um, but uh, it's got a lot of minis in it, so we did that. Um, Medieval's just came out from GMT. Um, new flight pan for the uh, Memoir 44 just came out uh, a week or two weeks ago. So those are three brand new items that we had this year. Um, there's always more in the works too. So uh, okay, thanks. Thank you, Eric. Anything you'd like to plug? Uh, yeah, so I'm I, well, I'm here uh, doing demonstrations for uh, Trudvang Legends, which is our big uh, experimental storytelling game that's going to come out in uh, Kickstarter uh, soon-ish. Uh, I'm doing some. I, I I can't do demos for that because we only have one production copy or, or pre-production copy in existence. So I I'm just going to show it at some tables. Uh, we have uh, in the hot games area. We have our um, we have uh, Foodies, which is a really great little family game. Um, it was a game we worked on for a year. It was the second game I signed after Gizmo. It's sort of in that family. Um, definitely, if you if you enjoy uh, like one to four, uh, two to four player games that are quick to learn, thirty minutes, highly addictive and replayable, definitely try that out. Um, and oh, I almost said something. I'm not. I'm, I can't plug it because I'm not allowed to talk about it. So just those two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you buy Erica a drink, he'll, uh, he'll be happy to tell you. <laughs> Erica? Um, yeah, if you're up for checking out Kodama 3D, is uh, back up on Kickstarter. Um, also, Bosk is over at the Hot Games table, so I'd love you guys to check that out and see if you enjoy playing that. And um, just a side plug, because it kind of relates to what we've been talking about here, is um, um, I co-host a show called Meeple Syrup. Um, it airs uh, live every Wednesday, and we do rotating of looking at, like, uh, from inside the industry, um, spotlights, looking at design, looking at mechanics, that kind of thing. So if this is the type of thing that you're interested in, you might like that show as well, because a lot of these lovely people often end up on the show as well. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. And Sydney? Seconding Kodama 3D, it's a really lovely, uh, super calming game. You get to build an actual beautiful little tree. 3D, just like the name implies, and that's on Kickstarter now. Uh, Aeon's End New Beginnings is also hitting retail pretty soon, and I did all the writing for that, so it's my personal love. I'm very <laughs> excited about it. I think it's great. Um, I, uh, Indie Game Studios does um, open submissions for prototypes, so uh, you can always uh, submit a sell sheet or a gameplay video to submissions at IndieBoardsAndCards.com or submissions at StrongholdGames.com. They both come to me, <laughs> so it's a faux dichotomy. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, uh, we're always willing to take a look through sell sheets and uh, let you know if it's something we'd be interested in. So. 
Thank you very much. And Faux Dichotomy is my new band name, so that's good. Um, so and, uh, I'm Jeff Engelstein, and I have a, a new book on game design that was just released last week called uh, Building Blocks of Tabletop Game Design, uh, so, which is an encyclopedia of uh, hundreds of different mechanisms for building up your games. So hope that you'll check that out. And thank you so much for attending, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your time here at Dice Tower Con. Thank you. Thank you all.